This second e-lecture about the phonological dialects of North America looks at these dialects, which are listed here, including the reference dialect which we already defined in the North. It looks at these dialects not in terms of their individual sound systems, but in terms of currently ongoing sound changes. Thus, we will define the phonology of North American English in the context of the recently published Atlas of North American English. In fact, it was published in 2005. Now, the Atlas of North American English is based on a large telephone survey of the urbanized areas of all English-speaking people in North America. It was conducted by the world's leading sociolinguist, William Labov, between 1992 and 2003. So this was the research period. Now, together with his co-workers, Sharon Ash and Charles Boberg, this is Sharon Ash, this is Charles Boberg, and this, of course, is Labov himself. Together with them, he interviewed a total of almost 800 subjects from something like 300 communities, including Canada and Alaska. The interviews were based on a variety of interviewing techniques to obtain different types of data, keywords, minimal pairs and so on. And to obtain reliable results, the data was examined acoustically and the resulting maps with their isoglosses were based on features such as formant analysis and other types of acoustic measurements. As a result, the Atlas of North American English provided a continental map of regional North American phonological dialects based on ongoing sound changes. Now, this dialect map and its numerous additional maps that trace the logic of these dialect definitions were published not only in book form but also on the CD-ROM and uh, well I can proudly say that we were the team here in Marburg that created the CD-ROM for Labov's team. The following main regional dialects were defined on this map. Now first of all we have the big region of Canada, this red isogloss then represented in green the west the blue isogloss is essentially the north and then we have the midlands or the midland variety and finally surrounded by the big south isogloss the south now these are the main phonological dialects the other areas for example here uh, you find an area inside the south which is called Texas South or another one uh, over here towards Georgia the inland south and so on and so forth now central to the new definition of these dialect boundaries or isoglosses are recent developments in the North American vowel system that is simple and complex vocalic changes let us start with an overview of the most prominent simple sound shifts. Now here's a selection of such sound changes. More are discussed in the Atlas itself and in the unit on the Virtual Linguistics Campus English in North America. Let's look at them in detail. Now the first one is the fronting of U and it applies to keywords such as two or two and it is a feature that applies to all varieties that are listed here so it is a unifying feature across the entire North American continent so the result would be something like two becomes two two the second one would be um, O the fronting of O in keywords such as go and we find that this feature is primarily realized in the Midland and in the South. Diphthongal A in words such as say can be found in a large number of varieties. For example, in Canada, 
in the north, in the Midland, not in the south, but in the west. So instead of saying se, you would still have a diphthongal version such as se. Very prominent is the low back merger in words such as cot versus caught, where the two vowels, the two low back vowels, o and o, merge to become identical in especially the Canadian dialect and um, of course in the West. Now the South does not realize this type of sound change but in the North and in the Midland we find transitional effects so some speakers do realize this uh, type of sound shift others don't. The pin-pen merger, the in-n merger by contrast only applies to the south. So you have words such as pen and pen which become identical. The glide deletion of I is another typical feature of the south where words such as five realize the vowel not as a diphthong but they delete the off glide and so five becomes fav. Canadian raising is a feature that not only applies to Canada but also to the north and the key word would be something like house where the onset of the au is raised towards o so house becomes house. And finally we have the Canadian shift which is a typical Canadian feature and it can be found in items such as pack which where the vowel is uh, uh, retracted so the result would be something something like pack thus we can find some sound changes that unify the entirety of North America for example the fronting of u others apply to large areas, diphthongal A and the low back merger and then we have uh, several ongoing sound changes that can be clearly associated with particular areas such as the south or the north. Furthermore there are additional regionally restricted sound shifts such as the short A split in the north and northeast or the southern drawl in the south. Some of these sound shifts even constitute the starting point of more complex system effects, the so-called chain shifts. Two of them are very prominent in North America. The so-called northern city shift and the southern shift. So let's start with the northern city shift. This is a chain shift affecting the short vowels of the English spoken in the United States regions bordering the Great Lakes. It is triggered by the general raising of a in man and that and back and then it is followed by a fronting of or, a lowering of or, and then quite interestingly the a in words such as get, yes and red is um, centralized so the result will be something like yes and red and get. This of course pushes the wedge out of the way, the central vowel and backs it so that words such as but will become but. Let us listen to an example. Now here's a good friend of ours, Dan Spencer from Detroit in Michigan. In fact he uses the same teaching method that of the inverted classroom. Let's listen first. I welcome all users to this website on linguistics. My name is Dan and I speak American English. Let's now listen to the stages of the northern city shift. So we said the first stage is the raising of a to e. Bet. Clear cut raising of a. The fronting of a. Cut. Well it is very much fronted. And then the lowering of a. Cut. The backing of a in words such as yes. Yes. Okay, and finally the backing and lowering of a, uh, the wedge as in but. So but will be? But. But, you hear the backing of 
uh, A. So this is a nice example of the northern city shift. The southern shift is triggered by the removal of I from the low central position. So in most southern states of the United States, the triggering movement is a monophthongization of I, which we've already seen here. So this was our example of the glide deletion of I, and it applies to the southern states. Now, when this monophthongization of I to R takes place, we can also observe a slight shift of the monophthongal nucleus towards the front as it enters the subsystem of long and in-gliding vowels. Let us represent all these changes on a map. Now the first dialect area which we looked at was Canadian and uh, with its main features the fronting of U, Canadian raising, Canadian shift and the low back merger. We didn't represent diphthongal A here because we confined ourselves to the four main features. By the way, we're using here the colors of the isoglosses that are used in the Atlas of North American English. Now here's the West as our next big dialect area and we see, represented in green here, that the fronting of U and the low back merger are two features that the, this and the diphthongal A, in fact, all these three features are shared with a Canadian. In the north we find again the fronting of U, Canadian raising, shared with Canada, diphthongal A, like in Canada as well, and here as a special feature, the northern cities shift. The next is the Midland, a transitional area where we don't find the low back merger but the fronting of U and O and diphthongal A. And finally the south, which is specific due to its realization of the southern shift, no low back merger, but it is unified with the other dialect areas by the fronting of U and the fronting of O. Let's listen to a speaker from the south. Here is a speaker from Jackson in Missouri. Let's listen to some examples first. So here you typically find the monophthongization of I. Bah. Bah. The two vowels in cot and caught are not merged. Cot. Cut. Then we typically have the fronting of U. Zoo. And finally, the in and merger we listed earlier on in words such as chin and pen, you would find no difference between the two vowels. Chin. Pen. Chin. Pen. Well, let's summarize. Just like in England, we have no uniform dialect situation in North America. Labov's study and that of his co-authors Sharon Ash and Charles Boberg have shown that the examination of ongoing sound changes allows us to define regions in North America that otherwise would have been separated either politically by means of their sheer distance or by social aspects such as prestige. To represent these sound changes and the North American vowel systems most adequately, a transcription system other than the one used for the varieties of English seems indispensable. This system, which takes into account the binary character of North American vowels, will be introduced in the e-lecture, the North American Vowel System.